This is Selma Schimmel for the group room at AACR, the annual meeting of the American Association for Cancer Research, taking place in Chicago. And we're joined now by Dr. William Hahn, Associate Professor of Medicine, Harvard Medical School, in the Department of Medical Oncology at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Hello, Dr. Hahn. Good morning. Good morning to you. And we are going to discuss the topic of functional and integrated genomics. However, a lot of people have no idea what I just said. So maybe we can begin with sort of defining what that is and we can start with the word genomics. Sure. So genomics is really a word that a lot of people are hearing these days and it refers to our ability to look at the DNA of all organisms and in this case we're concerned with the DNA of both tumor and normal cells in, in people's bodies. And genomics allows us to look at all of the sequence of the DNA and increasingly looking at the other components that make up cells, including RNA and protein. And so what's different about this compared to what we've done in the past is that we're looking at everything in a systematic way rather than looking at one thing one at a time. Let's go back to the Human Genome Project. The Human Genome Project is really the um, advance that had made all this possible. It's been about 12 years since we've had a draft sequence in the genome. And that knowledge has really given us the foundation or the blueprints to first to go after the genomes of any um, cell or tumor that we uh, would like to interrogate. And also um, to use that information to be able to now manipulate the expression of genes, um, which are the building blocks of, of the proteins that do all the work in cells, um, to understand their function. And really what we're trying to do these days is to use many approaches to get at the same problem because the use of a lot of approaches makes it simpler to understand which are the really important ones. If I recall, the Human Genome Project began, was it the late 80s, early 90s? Exactly. So it was the uh, late 80s, early 90s. It took about uh, 12 years to get the first draft genome sequenced, and that was announced in 2001. And since then, um, the technology to do that work, which initially took 12 years, um, has really been compressed so that a genome can be sequenced in a couple weeks now. Um, if not shorter. And uh, the cost uh, started out in the hundreds of millions of dollars and is now down to twenty or thirty thousand dollars. So in the area of oncology, how many mutations have we discovered since the start of the Human Genome Project? Well, that's a very difficult number because it's changing almost daily. Um, there are probably twenty thousand genes in the human genome, of which there's probably really good evidence now for two or three hundred of them being um, uh, directly involved in cancer. That number may increase by a little bit, um, but I think we're, we're starting to hone in on what uh, everybody hopes are the key players. So Dr. Hahn, when we speak in terms of genomics and cancer, and we are able to identify uh, geno genetic mutations that may make one more susceptible, and we look at new pathways, and then we develop these targeted or molecular therapies. They sort of all tie together because the goal then is to develop therapies that will respond to or target where these biologic problems are within the structure of the cell. Exactly. I think one of the things that um, we're doing and I think a lot of other people are trying to do is uh, we're trying to think of a cell as a series of networks. Um, just like you might have in um, computer systems and telephone lines at the airport with airline schedules, um, there's an interconnection between all the different pieces. And if you study one piece, you might come to the wrong conclusion about what's, what that piece is doing and what its role is in the overall um, network. Um, so what we're trying to do is understand the network of um, biological processes in cells and then try to understand how they've been changed or disrupted in cancer. Um, by understanding that, that should give us the targets or the places that we think we can intervene that will allow us to turn off the problems that are causing the cancer cells. Is the Human Genome Project ongoing? It is ongoing. It's changed names. It's now called the Cancer Genome Project or uh, the Thousand Genomes Project. Um, the goal there is to get even more information. Um, one of the things that I think we've realized is that um, although it was a great achievement to sequence one genome, the amount of information that we could derive from one genome pales in comparison to how much we can get from hundreds or thousands of genomes. 
and part beyond of, cancer for other disease types too. Absolutely, and part of the reason for that is um, it's, uh, it's a mathematical problem. If you have one thing, you can study it three times or four times and you can be sure that you've, an you've measured it correctly. If you have 20,000 things, you need to measure it many, many tens of hundreds or thousands of times before you're sure you understand what it's doing. And so that's why having more information and more genomes is so important. What is functional and integrated genomics? So one of the great things that has come out of the Genome Project is it spawned and uh, allowed us to develop many other complementary technologies to look at cancer genomes. So the initial Cancer Genome Project was um, looking at the bases of DNA in the genome and figuring out what their order is. Um, what we've been able to do since then is now be able to turn genes on, turn genes off, and measure the consequences of doing that. Would that be called genetic engineering? It's not really genetic engineering in the sense that we're not um, doing this to change organisms or change behavior um, as you might do in plants when you um, uh, try to engineer plants to be, have different properties. We're doing this in the laboratory with cells and, and experimental models to understand what the role of particular genes are in cancer. But one of the great things that we can do now is instead of manipulating one or two genes, we can manipulate all of the genes systematically. And then we can create data sets that allow us to say, if we manipulate all of these genes in these different contexts, we can figure out what their function is. And putting that together with the sequences of DNA that tell us which genes are mutated or um, disrupted in cancer, we can get a very good idea about which, what genes are um, broken in cancer and what are the consequences of, of that. Um, mutation. And the reason that's so important is that's where we're going to be able to develop new drugs and new therapies because the therapies have to be directed at the targets that are disrupted in cancer. As we look at the development of new therapies, once you identify a mutation or this pathway disruption, or how long does it really take to then, what is the process of trying to match a therapy if you can, in simple language, talk us through how those converge, the clinical development as it relates to this genomic understanding. That is something that uh, has concerned all of us for a long time. Some of the most successful drugs we have, like um, imatinib or Gleevec for CML, took 25 years from the discovery of the mutation to developing a drug and having something we can give to patients, and that's just too long. Um, what's great about what we're doing now is that you can take the discovery of a mutation to the idea that you develop a drug um, down from 25 years to a few months or even a year at the most. Um, the challenge then is whether or not we have a drug that we can test in people. And sometimes these days we do have that and uh, we can move it along very quickly. There's a very good example that uh, was just reported in the last year, and that is there's a mutation in some lung cancer patients of a gene called ALK, A-L-K. Um, that was discovered, reported, and it turned out that there was a, a small molecule drug that was being developed for a different purpose um, that could target ALK. They did the laboratory studies and the clinical studies, and it's been approved for patients um, this past year, and that whole process took only three years. And I think that that's really a great example of how this kind of integrated knowledge can really move the field forward and get um, therapies in the clinic much, much quicker. I understand these therapies, they work on these pathways, and it may be on uh, the cellular level of, of proteins or enzymes. Can you explain a little bit more about the cellular process that these drugs respond to, like the PARP inhibitor? responds for the breast and ovarian patients on this PARP protein. So we used to treat systemic with chemotherapy that goes, which is still a cornerstone of, of cancer treatment, but it attacks all rapidly dividing cells. Now you're honing in on the cellular components, like we mentioned these proteins and enzymes. Maybe you can explain that a little bit more. The goal of cancer therapy has always been to try to exploit a weakness or a behavior that cancer cells do that normal cells don't. And chemotherapy, as you pointed out, is really directed at a small difference between how fast the cells are, are growing. And the consequence of that is that we have lots of side effects. People lose their hair, they, they become nauseous, their, their blood counts go down. 
Um, and that's all a consequence of the fact that the drugs are not that specific for the tumors. Right, it's attacking all rapidly dividing cells. It can't differentiate, oh, you're the cancer cell and you're the hair follicle. Exactly. And so the newer drugs, what I think has um, generated a lot of excitement is that we're getting down to very specific things that are only present um, in a broken state in, in cancer cells. And the drugs become much, are hoping, and we're, um, some of them that, are, that have made it to the clinic are so much more specific that they almost have no effects on other tissues or, or minimal effects so that people have a small amount of a rash after getting the drug. Um, and that is really, I think, going to change how we think about cancer therapy. It makes it much easier to treat patients because the drugs work better. But it's also a better experience for patients because they're not sick and they're taking pills rather than being injected with um, drugs in their veins. And it's targeting the cell at, a, at its developmental process. Well, I think what we're looking for is what sometimes we call Achilles heels. There, there are changes that allow a cancer cell to be a cancer, but at the same time it exposes a weakness or a vulnerability um, that allows us to attack the cancer cell. It might be a signaling process, it might be a, diff, uh, a, a developmental process, it might be something to do with cancer metabolism, but they're all weaknesses that come about because a cancer cell needs to do certain things to misbehave and be a cancer. Um, and that it's really exposing those vulnerabilities that we're trying to And accomplish. it's a mechanism of turning on or turning off the malfunction within the cell? Exactly. So what we're very good, or what we're getting very good at doing, is if there's a mutation that turns a gene on um, so that it's overactive, that we can develop drugs that allow us to turn that gene off. Um, what we're still challenged with is if there's a gene that's turned off because it acts as a break to tumor progression, how to turn it back on. But I think people are really trying to go after those genes as well. What is a closing message you'd like to share with viewers, especially patients? What I think I'd like to say to patients is that uh, this is a tremendously exciting time. There's advances that are coming uh, very quickly um, and people are very much engaged in working together to try to push the best science forward as quickly as possible. Um, we very much appreciate everybody's support. Um, and I think that if you're a cancer patient, looking for more information, talking to your phys physicians, um, being involved in clinical trials, that helps our work go forward. It, it may help you, but it certainly helps all of the future cancer patients who are going to come after you. And what about the issue of tissue? I, I, I don't mean to make that uh, cliche sounding line. Tissue is incredibly important because that is really the ground truth of everything that we study. We can make models that allow us to do things in the lab, but anything that's important we have to find in patient samples. Um, it turns out that patient samples are difficult to obtain um, and we Why all... Why is that? Well, because I think what happens is Oftentimes, people are diagnosed at a, a very different place than they're treating. And getting those samples back to the place that's actually doing the research um, requires a lot of logistical planning. Um, we're very good at doing that, um, but we need more patients to allow us to say, we can use your samples um, in a very protected way to, to pursue our research and move it forward much more quickly. Thank you. It's been fascinating speaking with you, Dr. William Hahn, Associate Professor of Medicine, Harvard Medical School, Department of Medical Oncology, Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. Thank you. Pleasure.